don't know about y'all, but I'm ready to go to the beach. Any health nuts out there? Yeah, I, I've never, that's never been something that I've embraced until the last 10 years or so where I realized that I've had to, right? And so I realized I've got to make some changes, got to get healthy. Today we're, uh, we're talking about a mature church. We're talking about a healthy church. What does a healthy church look like? You know, it's funny when you talk about physical health. I was, I was trying to do some reading on the internet beforehand and uh, just all these articles. I mean, the articles are endless. Everybody's an expert, right? And uh, there was one article that was talking about how re- recently the United States is like blowing out of the water the most money putting in to the pursuit of good health, yet the results are just the opposite. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being so fixed on health and, and exploring all these different angles and like being committing yourself to health, but ignoring just some of the foundational aspects of health so it doesn't do you any good? And so when we look at a healthy church, I mean, you know, across the nation, I mean, there, there's so many good churches out there that are striving to be mature, that are striving to be healthy. But often we miss the mark. What is the mark of a healthy church? What does it mean to be mature? What does it look like to be mature? And so that's what we're going to explore today. This is a Paul's letter to Ephesians. If, if y'all are just joining us, we've been, we've been working our way through the book of Ephesians. Ignore my microphone. They're getting figured it out. But in the meantime, we're going to ride the waves, pun definitely intended. Uh, And the first three chapters are this beautiful exposition. Like, this is the doctrine of who we are. This is who you are in Christ. We are in union with with Christ together, collectively, individually. We are saved by grace through faith. But then part of the body, we are in Christ together. We are the church. And we explored it from all these different angles. And then the last three chapters that we've just started. Like, now that we have theology, this is how you put it into practice, because that's the whole point of doctrine. That's the whole point of theology, so that it affects our lives. And so Paul is going to, from all these different explain, all these different angles, walk in the manner of worthy of you, worthy that you have been called. How do we walk as a church? And today we're going to discover how do we walk together in such a way that we grow together in good health and maturity. So what are the marks of mature of the mature church. Before I look at uh, the passage today, Ephesians chapter 4, our our text is verse 7 through 16. I just want to reach back because, you know, Paul said, I, therefore, prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with the other in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That's Christ-likeness, right? Walk in a way where you pursue Christ likeness. And then he then he asserts the foundation. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the uh, to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. That was just a powerful creed that he was quoting from the early church that reminded them that, hey, I'm calling to you something beautiful and great, but it's all because of who you are in relation to our Trinitarian God. One God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, unity and diversity. I mean, that sets the stage for everything about our entire existence, to know God, to know the Trinity. And we really focused in on the oneness aspect of it, the unity, right? We are one. But Paul doesn't end there. That sets the stage for what he is about to talk about next. If we look at verse 7 and 8, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. What a striking contrast. If we, look at the, uh, if we could look at the verse here on the screen, what a, what a striking contrast that we see. We are one. We are one. We are one. One body, one faith, one God. But, we are also, but God also gives each of us. Hey, Garrett, do we have the slides? There we go. But grace was given to each of us. Unity and diversity. God has created us to be one. But in our unity, we also see that God gifts individually, specifically, in special ways. 
Grace was given to each one of us. Our unity doesn't mean uniformity. There is a sameness within our body, but we are definitely not all the same. And that is a good thing. Boy, I saw that on display people all week. People throughout the church setting up VBS, doing things with, with paper and wrapping stuff that I just cannot do. God has gifted y'all in such a way uh, that I am not gifted. And then I see other people working behind the scenes with finances and making decisions on the building and loving our kids in nursery. And I don't even know what goes on in there, but I know I'm not qualified for that. God has gifted his people in unique, diverse ways. And it always blows my, my mind to see when the church of Jesus Christ ri rises up that God brings the right people together. And we re when we really embrace this unity and diversity, we le lean into giftedness that God has given us. Whew, God does some amazing things. But grace was given to each one of us. Now, we got to look at that for a second because this could be a little confusing. I know what grace is, right? Y'all know what grace is? We know what grace is. Grace doesn't always have to mean the same thing every time when it shows up in Scripture. Elsewhere in Ephesians, it talks about how by, it is by grace we are saved through faith. That is saving grace. Saving grace, I mean, that's like, that's like the key to understanding uh, the Christian life, our ability to recognize by grace we are in need of a Savior because we were, we were born dead. We were born dead in our sins and trespasses, separated from God, far from God. And the only way to be with God is the gift of God. Jesus died on a cross for you. That is saving grace. That forgiveness is available. His grace he freely gives and says, yes, you, were, you, you deserve punishment because of the wrath of God towards sin, but Jesus died in your place, and you receive grace. Saving grace says that Jesus is reaching out his hand to each and every person to take his hand and become a child of God. That's saving grace. We talk about that all the time. But here it seems to have a different nuance. But grace was given to each one of us. We all receive the same, or we are all offered the same saving grace. But individually... Grace was given to each one of us. There, there's a nuance of serving grace, which is a little different than the saving grace. It's still by the power of God and uh, through the same God. So, I mean, it's all tied together. Our sanctification, the way we grow in Christ, is linked to our justification, the way we are saved in Christ, right? Um, our serving grace. God gifts his people and it's referred to as grace in this way. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, people a whole lot smarter than me have wrestled with the, the, the grammatical construction here, to, you know, exactly what's going on here. And I could probably say that a few times in this passage. There's a lot of things in these verses that we're looking at today where scholars wrestle over the nuance, okay? But the big picture, we have been, giving, we have been gifted in his church according to the measure of Christ's gift. According to the measure of Christ's, Christ's gift. Like there's a standard. Christ gifts us, and the standard is according to who he is and the gift that he has given. He has died on a cross for you. In love, he came down to be with us when he didn't have to. He set aside the privileges he had to come and take on human flesh and to be with us. And it's according to the measure of Christ's gifts that he gifts the church. He did something significant in his saving grace, and that extends to us as we live out our calling of who we are. Grace was given to each one of us. What is a, what is a gift? Uh, quite simply, it's a tool or ability that enables a Christian to perform a function in the body. That's a very simple definition. We, we, we could go on a much more complex journey about gifts, but a very simple definition is a tool or ability that enables a Christian to perform a function in the body. You have a function in the body. Grace was given to each one of us. How has God gifted you? 
How are you supposed to function in the body? Have you considered that? And there's specific things that he does to specific people, but you also see general ways in which he gifts. And I think a lot of that is wrapped in to this passage as he talks about how Christ has prepared and enabled and equipped the body to function. What does it say here about grace giving, the gifts given to each one? Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Well, this is a quotation from Psalm 68. So the psalm that I was weaving through our morning of worship, or our musical portion of worship this morning, um, was from Psalm 68. And that was to help us to get a, get a bigger glimpse of this beautiful, powerful psalm. Because New Testament use of the Old Testament, right? When the, when the New Testament quotes or refers to the Old Testament, sure, the surface on the surface, the words mean, like the The words that are on the surface mean something, but it's pointing back to something more, much more full when you look at the entire psalm, right? So if we just read Ephesians, we only see the quotation from Psalm 68, 18. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Okay, so if we know that it was Psalm 68, what do we know about Psalm 68 that could kind of help paint the picture about what might be going on? Did any, words, did any words stick with you as, as, we, as we praised our king? Hosanna, our king has come. The procession of our king, right? Uh, Psalm 68, the exact quotation was, You ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord may dwell there. Psalm 68 is a psalm of ascent. These psalms of ascent They portray the king who is coming to rule and to reign. And this one looks back, Old Testament, to the greatest act of deliverance. It looks back uh, to when God called Moses to go rescue his people out of bondage in Egypt. They were captives, right? They were captives in Egypt. And God led his people out of captivity to Mount Sinai. You read Psalm 68, it's full of this language of the mountain and going to the mountain. And so Jewish tradition looks at Psalm 68, and they see it as a significant psalm that points to the rescue of God's people from captivity, on the move, with, with God as their leader, as their king, delivering them and bringing them to the mountain where they became, Mount Sinai, that's where they received the Ten Commandments. That's where they received the, the covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, where God says, I will be your God and you will be my people. That was a significant moment in the life of the Israelites, the most significant in the Old Testament, where there, the nation of Israel was formed, the people of God were formed in this, co- this beautiful covenant, no longer captives. And as, the king, as, as God had conquered, as God had overcome, right, there's The gifts of that victory, the spoils of war, if you will, are then lavished upon his people. That's what our God did then. That's what he has always done. And so what we see here, you ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train. Now, there is some debate on the word captives. Some scholars think that the captives were the the enemy forces that have since been taken captive. But I, I tend to align with the scholars that say, well, the captives were the people who were captives, are no longer captives, and they're following the king. So this is, a, this is the imagery of the King Jesus conquering our behalf, ascending to a mountain, captives in train, receiving gifts among men. So here's, here's where it gets squirrely when you look at old, New Testament use of the old. Sometimes that's not exact, and that's okay. There could be various reasons about why it's not exact. A lot of times it's because we're summarizing. Right? I've, I do that many times when I'm referring to other things. We summarize. So it says here, he gave gifts to men in the New Testament. But in the Old Testament version, he received gifts among men. Some scholars say that both things are going on. The captives were follow, are following King Jesus, us, right? Now his people, Christ receives us, receive gifts among men. He receives his people And then he lavishes gifts upon his people. Like it's a both and kind of thing. Either way, however however you slice it up, what is clear 
is that the children of God enjoy the spoils of his victory. We enjoy the spoils of his victory. He has overcome, and that was not something he wanted to enjoy by himself. God is all about, an ex- is all about extending his rule and reign on, on this earth. That was, the, that was the commission from the very beginning in the book of Genesis. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Right? They place him in the garden to enjoy his kingdom. God wants to lavish his people with his gifts to flourish and to extend his kingdom. And so that's what's going on here. If we can move to the next slide. The mature church shares his victory. We share victory with our king. So Paul quotes the verse, and he quotes Psalm 68, and then he goes on to explain the verse. Your Bible, if you have the ESV, it has parentheses in there. Maybe some of your other Bibles have parentheses in there. There are no parentheses in the original text. That's just not something they had. But the translators are trying to help us out, and they've added parentheses to show that Paul, in verses 9 through 10, he's explaining what he's just quoted. He's dropped the Old Testament reference. He's mentioned this word ascending. Okay, let's talk about it. In parentheses, let's, let's talk a little bit more about what it, what it meant for an ascension to happen. And what are some of the things implied with that? So that's what's going on here. There's a grammatical or a cultural term called a pesher, where the, the Jewish authors, they would, they would insert an explanation, an explanation, a pesher, to describe what has happened before. So in, in verse 9 through 10, in saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth. He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all heavens, that he might follow all things. Psalm 68 is great in helping point out that Jesus Christ ascended in victory. Our king ascended in victory. But Paul makes sure that we don't miss the full package there. An ascension implies a descension. Is that the word? Is that even a word? I don't know. Uh, Christ descended. Again, this is one of those scholarly debated kind of areas. In what way did he descend? Some scholars think... He descended to Hades. There's other verses in the New Testament that talks about Christ going down, and that's a whole different topic of discussion because I don't think that's what's going on here in this passage. Other scholars think he, this is talking about him descending to the grave, to the earth, right? He was buried, possibly. But I line with the scholars that think this is talking about the big picture of the incarnation. Philippians chapter 2, also by Paul talking about how the body operates, right? Philippians chapter 2, one of the most incredible passages, um, Christological passages, passages about who Jesus is and what he has done. It talks about how we should have the same attitude and humility in, as Christ Jesus. And it says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus Christ humbled himself. He descended from the heavens, setting aside all the privileges that he had as God, the Son, right? He descended and took on human flesh, The crucifixion only happens because of the incarnation. We focus on the cross for right reasons. It is the climax, but it is not the full picture of what Jesus did for us. He descended. He came down to be with us. He incarnated amongst us. He took on flesh. And that's that's what made the cross so powerful. He, He took on our flesh. So all the struggles that we endure... He endured, and he overcame. He knows. He understands your pain. He descended to be amongst us, and he did it in such a way that Adam could not and did not. He, in his flesh, lived a perfect, sinless life, which is why he was able to be the only possible 
substitute on the cross for our sins. It was the dissension of Christ that made the ascension possible. He ascended, and he also descended. He who descended is the one who has also ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. He descended in order so that he could take our, our punishment, and he ascended to bring victory so that he might fill all things. This language of filling all things, it's shown up time and time again in Ephesians. Jesus Christ fills all things. We're talking about the church here, right? He, and Jesus did this for us so that we might experience the spoils of his victory. And so just a couple weeks ago, Joel was preaching from Ephesians 3, and this was the prayer at the end of, because this is the beginning of the second half of the book, the end of the first half of the book. How did it end? This powerful prayer. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power. This is victory language. That you may be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. The prayer in Ephesians is that the church may be filled with his fullness. Jesus Christ has won the victory so we can experience his fullness. We see this once again. He descended out of great, for love, great love for us and ascended on high so he could spoil and lavish victory on and through his people. We participate in the victory when he lavishes us with the spoils of war. How does that work? Let's look at the next verses. We're going to see that the mature church is an equipping church. The mature church is an equipping church. That's a big word. We'll get back to that. I'll read it from here. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. These are often used in discipleship, curriculum, and uh, just anything about the functioning of the church. A lot of important descriptions going on here. And he gave. Our Savior gave leaders to the church. Leaders in which they have specific giftings from God by the power of the Holy Spirit to fulfill their function. The church operates with leadership. Church needs leadership. What can we gather from these titles? Now, we could, we could spend all day on these, but I just want to kind of give an overview of what, what's going on here. Again, scholars debate exactly what is being said with these labels. Are all of these present day? Or are all of these, or were some of these first century for the, for the in, initial founding of the church, right? Because there was something significant going on in the early days of the church as as the Lord was inaugurating his church and launching the church in such a way. I mean, there were significant things that were uh, special to that time period. Apostles and the prophets. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, it talks about the top apostles and prophets being the foundation. The foundation being the, the scripture, the canon was established through the apostles and the prophets. And so some would say, well, those were, these were functions of the church that were specific to that time. Others were saying, well, all of these are, are uh, uh, leadership functions that God gifts today. Now, I think there's a both and going on. I do think that there was apostles and prophets. They were specific functions in the early church. But we also recognize that there's a functionality that is maintained. What is an apostle? Well, an apostle, what do you picture with an apostle? Y'all picture in the apostles? There's 12, right? That, that's the first thing that, that if you've been around church for a while, we tend to think of the 12. Those were the disciples that followed Jesus the, closely, the closest, the most intimately. We think of them as, they're known as the apostles. Well, Scripture also talks about additional apostles in, in addition to the 12. 
um, that existed in the time of the New Testament. But they all had the same idea. of These were the ones that God was sending to initiate and inaugurate the church. There is a sending aspect. There's a missional function of apostleship. And while the apostles, I do believe, were unique to the first century, their missionaries are a function of apostleship today, the sending function, to go into unknown places, to new places, to bring the gospel. So wherever you land on that, um, we can still embrace the functionality of God raising up sent ones. Prophets. Prophets. God spoke through prophets. Uh, we hear about it all the time through the Old Testament and the New Testament. Scripture was formed as God spoke through men. Tend to use the language today sometimes of people being prophetic. That God, uh, that, that sometimes people are, are more particularly in tune to how the Spirit may be speaking through His Word. Right? That's language that's used no matter where you land on whether there are or are not prophets today. The evangelists. What does evangelist mean? Evangelist, the root word is to proclaim the gospel. The Greek word is euan galitsko. And if you were to write it out in English, it's, it looks an awful lot like the word evangelist. God has raised up leaders who are specifically um, gifted in the ability to share the gospel. Now, sometimes people, it's very easy to look at this and be like, mm, that's not me. I don't have this gifting. That's clearly the Billy Grahams of the world. That's a, you know, all these other evangelists that are gifted in sharing the gospel, so I don't have to worry about it. Okay, just because somebody, God has gifted someone in a special way, that doesn't take the pressure off the rest of us. Matter of fact, all five of these, sentness, listening to God's voice in his word and being in tune to how God is speaking, sharing the gospel, shepherding, which we'll get to, and teaching Every single one of us should be growing as a disciple, trying to grow in these areas. Every single one of us. Yes, we look and see that God has raised up certain people to build his church in such a way. Some ways unique to the first century and, and some in timeless ways. But each and every one of us, you know, we can argue all day about what exactly is the office of each of these. But these are all functions that we should embrace. We should all be going into places where God is sending. To whom have you been sent? Apostolic ministry, prophetic word. The more time we spend time in God's word, we become accustomed to knowing God's voice and hearing him through his word. It's called illumination. The spirit speaks through his word and we should strive to hear God's voice and to communicate how God is speaking through his word to the church. We must be people who share the gospel. How will people know if we are not sharing the gospel? We don't wait for the, for the, the rest of these leadership types to come in to share the gospel with your friends. God has placed you right where you're at to share of his love and how God changed your life, how Jesus Christ changed your life. Because I'll tell you what, your story of how God changed your life is with, with the people in your circles who know you, that's going to be so much more effective than the, the, the gifted evangelists. Your story matters. Looking at the shepherds and the teachers. Now, one thing to notice, there's only one the, the definite article. All of these have definite articles before them, and scholars note that they're the shepherds and teachers. So the argument here is, is that one function, shepherd teachers, or are we talking about two different, two different functions? Well, ultimately, it doesn't really matter. It's good to understand what was being said. The idea of shepherding, this could be just as easily be said, the pastors and teachers. To pastor is to shepherd. To elder, to eld is to shepherd. The term bishop is the same kind of deal. There's a lot of terms that we have out there, but they're ultimately the same thing. Who are the shepherds of God's people? Who cares for the flock? And I think that maybe this, while I do think not all teachers are shepherds, right? All shepherds must be teachers, I think that's the association that's going on there. All shepherds must be teachers, but not all teachers are shepherds. So we are the church. How does a healthy ch church function? A healthy church does function utter, under the leadership of people that God has gifted for centuries and then the here right now. But don't bury the lead. 
This isn't ultimately focusing on the leadership. We can, we can discover much by trying to chew on what's being said about these leaders. But the point is, leadership exists to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Who does the work of the ministry? Well, you know, if we weren't looking at this passage right now, and if I were to just put something on, just do a, on, the, on the streets, ask that question, I mean, you know what they, they'd be saying. Well, the pastor does the work of the ministry. The saints do the work of the ministry is what Scripture says. Who are the saints? Now, that's a misleading word because we tend to think of saints in a different way just because culturally, I mean, I, I think y'all are picturing people with robes. and No, no, the saints is Christians. The saints are those in Christ. You are the saints. We, the people of God, are the saints. And God gifts leaders to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. The church only grows. The church only grows in maturity. The church is only healthy if the saints will embrace being equipped in order to do the work of the ministry. That is how the body of Christ is built up. And we only go so far as the church is willing to embrace that. How are you being equipped? I think that's a really good word. I love that word. A lot of times we talk about, I, I try to, to move the language away from classes and teaching to equipping. Because in a class, you show up to be taught. Somebody who is wise in the ways of Scripture comes and teaches you, and you walk out smarter. But if you recognize that you're getting equipped, you realize that, that you're being tr- not just taught, but trained in how to walk in a manner worthy of our calling, trained to be a part of the body of Christ, trained to stand firm and equipped. You're walking away with tools. And you're recognizing, I'm, I'm supposed to take these tools and to put them into practice. They don't just sit in the, my, your garage, unless you're at my house. Most of them sit in the garage. You're supposed to be equipped with tools that you actually put into practice to build up the body of Christ. Which is why I love that it just so happens that it's VBS week that we're, that we're going through these verses. Because this has just been the coolest week. Seeing so many of you guys just stepping in, trying new things, being equipped. Some of y'all are going to be teaching this week. You've been handed a curriculum. That's one way in which you're equipped. And we said, go get them. The Holy Spirit's going to lead you. You are stepping out in faithfulness. You don't need a pastor in there. You don't need one of, your, one of the teachers of the church to, to, to be alongside you, to tell you how to do it. You've been equipped, and you've got the Spirit of God right there with you. Awesome things are going to happen because you're stepping out in faithfulness to be equipped. What does that word equipped mean in the original context? You know, if, we, if you were to look at how that term that Paul used, how it showed up. There are a few different ways of how it showed up in the, the ancient Greek world. One was of setting of broken bones. I didn't expect to see that. Setting of broken bones. So an equipping. So if a bone was disjointed, a medical professional would, would equip the bones by putting them back together so they can function rightly. No more brokenness. We are a broken people. We were bro- born in a broken world. But by the, the Spirit of God is moving amongst the church to equip his people to mend brokenness and to make whole. The next definition is outfitting a ship for journey. <laughs> outfitting a ship for journey. So when a ship goes out to sea, it's going to be out to sea for a long time. Any good sailor knows it needs to be outfitted properly to withstand all the possible things that are going to happen. Outfitted for journey. Later, we're going to get to putting on the full armor of Christ, right? There, there, there's this, and that's Ephesians chapter 6. Here, there's the picture of we are, we are going on a journey as the church, and our Lord equips us. He puts on what we need for the journey. The third is my favorite. Equipping was also used in regards to fishermen, to fisher nets. When the nets were broken, which is what happened in fishing nets of the day, Every night, they'd have to work on their nets. They would have to mend them back together. They would have to equip their nets, per se. People really understood this language of fishing. The apostles, a lot of them were fishermen. Jesus said, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Jesus did amazing thing amongst them when he called them to go fishing with him. 
Matter of fact, I got in the boat with Jesus. And they're like, there, there's no fish going on over here. And Jesus said, drop your nets. The, the nets pulled up so many fish that the boat almost capsized. But those nets had been equipped in such a way that they were able to hold and that they were able to do. They were hold in such a ways that you wouldn't believe a bunch of strands meshed together could possibly do. What's a net? What is a net? A net is a whole bunch of insignificant looking strands woven together to become this, this mighty net. You just look at the strand and you're like, this strand is not capable of anything. But when these strands are equipped together, you drop that net out to sea and you see what it can hold, that's a powerful thing right there. Jesus is still doing significant things through insignificant people, seemingly insignificant people in his church. We are a net as the body of Christ. He equips us together. and He will blow your mind how he's going to use you if you are willing to be equipped by him as part of his church to build up the body of Christ. So then why is this important? Let's look at the next couple of verses. Verses 13 through 14. For building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro, by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. A mature church is not swayed. Here we get to the main idea, right? The goal is maturity. The problem is we don't start with maturity. We start in immaturity. We start as children. And that's natural. A new Christian, I mean, it's beautiful. It's awesome. They don't know anything, and that's all right. All they know that is that Jesus changed their lives. That's good enough. That, that's all you need to, to know to start. Here's the thing about kids. Kids are cute. cute. Kids are like you just adore looking at little kids when they're supposed to be little kids, but when they're supposed to grow up, those kids better grow up. The same thing in the church. We are not to remain as children. We are supposed to grow. No longer be children. To mature manhood. That idea of manhood, that means a complete person. Well, who's the person? To the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. We are called to Christ-likeness. That is maturity. We look forward to who Jesus is through his word. That's the goal, to grow more and more conformed in his image. We talk a lot about that, but sometimes we act like children. I talk a lot about growing in maturity, but I tell you, in my own life, sometimes I just want to be Peter Pan in it. just want to be a kid in this area. Uh, I don't really want to grow up today. I stole that from somebody else in this room. But anybody else, uh, anybody else have Peter Pan days where you wake up and like, nope, not today. Don't want to grow up. I know we don't want to admit it, but when it comes to growing in our faith, there are areas that we're holding on to and saying, yep, I'm going to be Peter Pan right here. I'm going to do it the way I want. I'm going to be a kid. I don't need to grow up. We have blinders. I love the image of the sea as I stand here. You know, I've been writing this sermon all week. I didn't realize I would actually be standing on a beach uh, during this sermon. Y'all like the beach? I'm okay with the beach. I'd much rather go to the mountains. I'm a go up to the mountains kind of guy, but my family likes the beach. My cousin, my cousin uh, is big on the beach, and so often he invites us down. So we go to Galveston every once in a while. You know, I'm an adult, and I recognize that you're supposed to respect the sea, and you're supposed to be wise in the sea. But, you know, when you're an adult, when you've grown, sometimes you forget about how dangerous the sea can be. Anybody have any experiences with that? I hope not. Because I, I remember the day that I, I learned to truly take the ocean seriously. I mean, I thought I was taking it seriously because, you know, I'd grown up going to the beach occasionally. And so I'm going with kids, and I've got, I've got a few kids with me. I think we had three at the time. 
And uh, my oldest was, was just a little kid, but he was getting a little braver to do stuff. And I'm like, but he wasn't that, he wasn't uh, overly brave. So I wasn't too worried about him. Um, I'm like, you know, just stay, just don't go in too deep, stay with adults. And that worked all well and good until we didn't actually specify which adult would stay with him. And he was with some cousins and apparently they didn't feel particularly responsible for him. So I'm on the beach and I look up and there's my son out there in shoulder length water. And I realize he's going a little further, a little further. And I'm looking around, I'm like, Maybe this, isn't, uh, maybe this isn't right, so I'm going to start making my way out to there. And I get about halfway, and I realize like, he looks like he's just across the room from me, but I feel like I've gone a mile already, and he's going further. And all of a sudden, I realize I, we have not taken the seat nearly seriously enough. We had the talk. We thought we were protected, but he was still going. And at this point, I realized there was a family that had been watching us, and they were nervous for us too. Unfortunately, my wife hadn't seen us, so she's not panicking yet. But I'm just making my way in the ocean. Now I'm shoulder level, and he's still out there. And I'm not sure if he's panicking yet or not. But I finally get out to him, and I'm struggling. And, uh, but I'm trying to make it, not make, it, make it look like I'm not struggling. I get him, like, can you swim? And he's like, oh. And um, we made our way back, and uh, I tried to, like, pass it off, no big deal, but we were dangerously close to being that family on the news and it not being good at all. And uh, to this day, now that I've had that wake-up call, we take the ocean absolutely seriously, and I'm so thankful that the Lord worked in that moment. And it's wild, as you know, this week I've been preparing, preparing for this sermon, and twice I've seen instances of grown adults thinking that they were fine and washed away. One of them was a family from Pennsylvania, parents of six kids, I think, and uh, they were out in the ocean, and a riptide came in Florida, and it just sucked them away. Two parents gone. I know that one's true. The other one I saw on the internet, it must be true because I saw it on the internet, but it was this boyfriend and girlfriend, and they share this kiss, and they're, they're in regular clothes. They're not even in the water. And then you see a wave wash them up, and it just pulls her right out. She's gone. Church, are we taking the wind and the waves of craftiness and doctrine and human cunning and deceitful schemes, are we taking it seriously? This imagery is supposed to mean something to people that knew the sea and knew that you take the ocean seriously. This language was meant to be a wake-up call to the church who knew that. Are we taking doctrine and truth and being built on this and grounded in this, and growing this in such a way that we are healthy and strong and with, with able to stand. Are we taking it seriously? I love the theme of this week's VBS. Breaker, breaker, rock, breaker rock Beach, God's rock-solid truth in a world of shifting sands. Are there shifting sands out there? Are there deceitful? Are, are there, do we see human cunning? Do we see craftiness, deceitful ways? There is false doctrine outside of the church but and inside the church that would sway us in such a way that we are washed away from our foundation. Are we growing in our faith? Are you being actively equipped in the word of God? A lot of times people think, I'm not a pastor. I haven't gone to seminary. We all need to grow in our ability to handle God's word. We all need to be willing to take next steps into to learning how to, to, to find ourselves in the story of what God's doing. Otherwise, there are false narratives out there. There are lesser stories that are going to steal us away. And before we know it, we're on shifting sands, and the wind and waves are going to rock us. I, uh, college ministry this uh, last semester, I've been, I went through the themes of this book uh, by Shane Pruitt. Anybody heard of Shane Pruitt? Man, he's great. He, uh, uh, he's an evangelist, and he's spoken at many different events. He's also next-gen director for the North American Mission Board, which is Southern Baptist uh, local missions. Uh, nine common lies Christians believe. He, he's quoting a bunch of Christian cl cliches out here. Some of you have probably heard these. Some of us, myself included, have probably used some of these. God won't give me more than I can handle. God gained another angel. God just wants me to be happy. I could never forgive that person. Follow your heart. God doesn't really care. I don't think God likes me. Believe in yourself. These are the types of waves that are operating even in the church that would break us down. 
and keep us for the goodness that God wants us to have as a church and as his people. This is what he has to say about it. Um, he said, we'd convinced ourselves that we had to be okay. After all, we were not only Christians, but also Christian leaders, right? We're supposed to put on a happy face. We committed to move past the religious jargon after our wake-up call and turn our focus back to the intended truth of the word of God. Once we dug deeper than what cultural Christianity has to offer, we began to get real with, with, the scripture, with the scriptures again. Thankfully, this caused us to be honest about our struggles and become authentically unafraid to speak about our failures and letdowns. Then and only then did we begin to walk in freedom, the sweet freedom that brings the beautiful comfort and transformational power to walk through any storm and face any mountain. The truth of God's word reminded us that God is doing all things for his glory and our good. It's only in this freedom that we can truly experience a peace that is beyond our understanding. Let's look at the last two verses. The mature church inhabits truth. Mature church, first off, doesn't get swayed by the false truths and the truths that would steal what God has for us, but we must be people that inhabit truth. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is a powerful visual. This is what we're called to be. And it begins by speaking the truth in love. Now, that's a good phrase, a helpful phrase when it's appropriate, but many scholars would agree that this is really not the, the most accurate, accurate rendering of what Paul is getting at, speaking the truth in love. Right? We should speak the truth in love, but that's it's really fallen short of what Paul was getting at because if we were to... Look at what Paul actually said. Well, it's language we don't actually use, so it's not real words. I mean, I like to make up words, but other people have problems with that. It would be truthing in love. Rather, truthing in love, we are to grow up in every way to him as head. How is that different? I'll tell you what, as a church, we're very good about speaking truth sometimes. But sometimes it just stays there. We've got to be so much more than words. Here's some John Stott was the one who offered this idea of truthing and love. This is, this is a truthing church. Thank God that there are those in the contemporary church who are determined at all costs to defend and uphold God's revealed truth. But sometimes they are conspicuously lacking in love. Uh-oh. When they think they smell heresy, their nose begins to twitch, their muscles ripple, and the light of battle enters their eyes. They seem to enjoy nothing more than a fight. Others make the opposite mistake. They are determined at all costs to maintain and exhibit brotherly love. But in order to do so, are prepared even to sacrifice the central truths of revelation. Both of these tendencies are unbalanced and unbiblical. Truth becomes hard if it is not softened by love. Love becomes soft if it is not strengthened by truth. The apostle calls us to hold the two together, which should not be difficult for spirit-filled believers since the Spirit, Holy Spirit himself is himself the spirit of truth, and his first fruits is love. There is no other root than this to a fully mature Christian unity. Church, this is what we are called to, fully mature Christian unity, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it's equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. This is our calling, and it's beautiful, and this is the stuff that changes the world. To wrap up, if we can look at the last slide. So these are the marks of a mature church. How's our health? We need to do a health inventory. Every church must always be doing a health inventory. Where are we falling short? Where are you falling short? A mature church portrays oneness, the unity and diversity of who our God is. A mature church shares in his victory. He has overcome. He has spoiled us, spoiled us with the spoils of war to extend his rule and reign in this earth. And a mature church, no longer children, growing up to a mature manhood that is not swayed which only happens in the fullness of Christ. And a mature church inhabits that truth. We must be truthing people. 
people that are willing to not just know truth, not just speak truth, but to live out the truth in ways that are uncomfortable, in ways that are radical, and that can only be done, only be done by the power and spirit of God. This is how a church operates in the fullness. And until we operate out of his fullness, rather than just the ways that we're comfortable and the ways we like, then we aren't truly healthy and we aren't truly mature. Church, I'm excited about the direction we are headed. Let's step forward and, um, and be what God has called us to be. I'm going to close out with a word of prayer, but I just, I'm just going to ask each of us to close our eyes right now as we close. And I want you to first picture what are you holding on to? What am I holding on to that's keeping me from growing? And let it go. Lord God, you give us strength to overcome. You have overcome the grave. You gift us in such a way by the power of your Holy Spirit that we can be used by you. And you gift us in such a way that we operate in your fullness and we can overcome by your Spirit. So God, I just pray for each person here. May we let go to whatever we're holding on to, whatever bad habit, whatever like secret pleasure, Lord, that keeps us from health. May we break the patterns of, of bad routines and just choosing our own Peter Pan kind of way, Lord. I don't want to grow up. I just want to be how I am right now. God, would you release us to be a church that operates in your fullness according to the measure of Jesus Christ? Lord Jesus, may we be changed by you so we portray you and reflect you and can be a church that is an ambassador for you in this world. For your glory we pray. Amen.